All right, so today, Holy Spirit, part three. Every one of these messages was stand alone, and this one will today. But I just had this heart to really deliver some things that I think we miss as God's people in walking in the Spirit and understanding the things of the Spirit. It's just a very important series. The foundations here, week one, is the Holy Spirit is not a ghost. He's not Casper. He's the very breath and the wind of God, the breath and the wind of God. That's who the Holy Spirit is. Jesus said it's better that he goes so that the Holy Spirit will come. And know this, the Holy Spirit is very present. In week two, we talked about the three baptisms, especially spent some time on the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And so if you've ever had some questions on that, I pray that I, I, as I communicated just from the word, that the word cleared some of that up for you. If uh, you get a chance, I want to encourage you to listen to that. That was here a couple weeks ago, week two that we talked. Today, I want to talk about the flesh and the spirit, the flesh and the spirit, and talk about the war that's going on within. You've probably experienced at some level as a Christian the flesh and the spirit fighting each other within yourself. Everybody has, and Galatians 5 explains this in verse 16. It says, so I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you're not to do whatever you want. I love that. They're in conflict with each other. We have to see that the desires of the flesh are in complete contradiction to the desires of the Spirit. If you don't see that in your own life, then you're not going to live according to the purpose God has for you. The Spirit and the flesh will never lead you in the same direction. Just won't do it. They're always working against each other. And you can bank on the fact that you'll never one day after walking in the flesh just wake up in the Spirit. I mean, if you continue to give in to the flesh, you'll never just one day say, boy, I just woke up this morning, I'm so full of the Spirit, I'm just renewed today. It's not going to happen. Contrary, if you are continually walking with the Spirit of God, you're not going to wake up one day and ask yourself how you got so deep in sin. And I just don't know how I got myself so miserable and how able not to function. Following the leading of the Spirit leads you away from the flesh. Are you hearing that today? It's very important that you get that. Probably the most difficult thing to do in the Christian life is to learn to daily, minute by minute, walk in the Spirit and deny the flesh. People feel that there is a continual tug of war. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of Tom and Jerry. I don't know if you ever watched this show. This clip, I thought about putting a few of them up, but it seems like I watch this a lot because I have grandkids and they enjoy that. And when I watch it with them, I've seen this little part of the cartoon that pops up all the time. It's this red devil on one shoulder and a white angel on the other. And it's like Tom's sitting here going, do I kill him today? because I hate that little mouse, or should I be nice? And it seems like he always gives in to the devil. And the other thing that makes me mad about it is the little devil over here always looks really cool and mean, and the little angel looks like a wimp. That's just my frustrations. And and so I I don't know if you've ever felt that way, but it's kind of in your life. It's like the, the devil's over here in my mind going, okay, Ashley, you ought to do this. And the angel's over here saying, you know you shouldn't. <laughs> and and, and I, I, I find that, and I, I want to find some scripture because I think that that's a real illustration of the flesh and the spirit. Paul's talking about this in Galatians. Once again, that verse in 517, they're in conflict with each other. You're not able to do whatever you want. You've got to listen to one or the other. Now, Paul's writing to the Christians, and he's saying, once the Spirit of God is inside of you, that means you're saved, once you're saved, your desires change, and the flesh is trying to keep you from what your spirit really wants you to do. 
So you desire the things of God, and when you follow Jesus more and more, you don't desire the things of the world. Now, it doesn't mean that you're never tempted by them. Hear me. You desire, once you're saved, there's a desire for the things of God. But it doesn't mean that you're never tempted by the little red devil trying to mess with you, and he does that through your flesh. People get saved, and their friends will ask, well, why don't you want to do this with us anymore? Well, here's why. Because God changed my desire. I don't desire that anymore. That's not a desire of mine. Romans 7, and I'm not going to go there because of time, but I want to get into Romans 8 today. But Romans 7, verses 14 through 25, if you want to study about this, talks a lot about it. Uh, and, and Paul's talking about being frustrated with himself. Like, I do the things I don't want to do. I'm at war with myself. What the Spirit wants versus what the flesh wants. It, it's an internal war inside the heart of man. And we struggle with who's in control all the time. I deal with this just in the flesh and the Spirit. I mean, my wife and I, we were the other day, we got on the golf cart. And I have a souped-up golf cart. I like to go fast. And so I, I got one that goes a little faster than normal. And, and we get on it, and, I, and she doesn't like me going that fast, so I go kind of slow, as slow as my foot will allow me. And I do. I, I, I contain that flesh, and I keep it backed off a little bit. And she makes a comment, and she said, you know, it's such a nice night. We ought to go for a walk. We're already on the golf cart. Like, am I supposed to stop it right here and just, and my flesh took over and I hit the soup up mode. (laughs) I mean, no, we're not walking. We're on the golf cart. We can walk tomorrow, but we're already here today. And I think that I just can't get that out of my head. We're going to start a diet tomorrow. We're going to start working out tomorrow, which always, Paul's talking about something about putting your flesh away. And I'm telling you, it's a hard thing. Paul's talking about something, though, way deeper than just taking a walk. He's talking about the desire of the flesh for sinful things. And he's saying, I don't desire to do those things, but I'm frustrated that I keep finding myself in that temptation, in that place. Okay, maybe maybe someone here today is finding that you're in a place that you're not desiring to do something, but you're trapped in it. And, and, and you find yourself continually doing it, but I don't desire it, but I just keep doing it. And maybe that someone here today needs to hear this. There is hope for whatever that is that you're not desiring, but you find yourself continually doing. Now, whatever that is, you fill in the blank. Paul ends chapter 7 in Romans with asking, who's going to save me from all of this? Who's, what am I going to do here? And then he says, the answer will be found in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then in Romans 8, he gives the how to live the Zoe life. How we're going to walk in the Spirit. We're going to live in the Spirit. And today I want you to know the Holy Spirit gives us the desire to overcome sin. And He gives us the power to overcome sin. He gives you the desire to overcome. And it shows that you are in Him. And if you have no desire to overcome, if you feel, well, I don't even have a desire to overcome. Then don't leave this building today without getting saved. Because salvation will give you the desire to overcome. But it won't give you the escape just by making a profession, a confession of faith in Jesus. That's not what's going to allow you the escape. That's the start. And then the Holy Spirit says, I'll give you the life that will help you. And I'm telling you, it's for all of you today. It's for all of us. He doesn't say... Aren't you glad once you're saved that now you have the right desires, so good luck? That's not what he says. That would be so cruel to give you a desire and then not give you a means to overcome. 
the things that are lurking and trying to destroy. He gave us the Holy Spirit so we'd have the power needed to fulfill the desire to overcome the flesh. Come on, we got to overcome the flesh. They're in contradiction to each other. So today, how to overcome the flesh with power from Holy Spirit. It's going to be a great message. That's the introduction. Romans 8, verse 1 says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Paul says, Hey, now that you belong to Jesus, I want to show you how you can live according to the way God has outlined it. He talked in seven, right where we all are, that that frustration. And then eight, he says, I I want you to know there's a way you can do this. And so I'm going to give you the outline. Romans 8, verse 2. And because you belong to him, all right, you're saved. Because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did. What the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, flesh, but instead follow the spirit. What he says and what he's saying is, hey, good news. Good news, everybody. There's some good news today. Sin no longer has control over you. Jesus paid for you to be free from that control, that slavery. And when you follow the Spirit in relation with the Spirit, you'll have the power to overcome that sin pull. I'm going to call it a sin pull in your life. Now, I want to give four points today so you can follow along with what I'm doing. And I've put them uh, on the screen for you. I, I want you to know they're very important how to overcome the flesh. And I'll start with number one. You do not have to obey the flesh. You do not have to obey the flesh. There is power in sin. Let me explain this. There is a power of sin. And that power is a pull to lead you to death. That's the power of sin. But there is a power of the Spirit of God that is greater than the power that sin has. And you don't have to obey your flesh. Boy, I'm just telling you, I'm dealing with it, Pastor. This may sound really simple. It is. And for some reason, the enemy tries to pull the wool over your eyes and say, wait, the power of sin's just got you. There are laws associated with the kingdom of darkness, and for you to be a part of that kingdom, you have to obey those laws. I mean, it's, and there's a power of sin that it wants to rule in your life, and there was a time that you were, in essence, powerless to live a victorious life. Come on, before salvation, you were powerless. I can't live a victorious life. And so you got saved. And when you got saved, there was that desire. You now have access to live with power and not live according to the laws that you were held by when you were not saved. That's why we sing, we're no longer a slave to sin. I'm no longer. But why do God's people act like they are? Because they don't realize that you don't have to obey the flesh. You you don't. You have access to live with power and not live according to the laws that held you when you were not saved. You're no longer a slave to sin. There's a real enemy, and he'll try to convince you that you are held. And there's nothing I can do here. And he'll try to remind you of what you have done. And he'll throw it in your ear and in your eyes and where you messed up. And it, it sounds something maybe kind of like this. Hey, your mom was an addict and you're an addict. And you'll always be an addict. And you can't overcome this addiction. And so 
everyone that deals with this is dealing with exactly what you are. And you really can't overcome it, so you're just going to have to deal with it. And every once in a while, it's okay that you give in to it. That's what that voice says. Just sitting here yelling it in your ear, just sometimes whispering it. Your dad was stuck in pornography. You've been in it. It's just a family thing. Everyone does this anyway. In fact, you're weird and abnormal if you don't. See, that's what that voice sounds like. It's trying to say, you're trapped. But they never say you're trapped. Just give in. Just one more time. Just give in. It'll be okay. Your dad always went off on you, and that's what you've been taught. And so you go off on other people, and you say, well, I just don't know any better. That's, what I, that's how I was raised. And it feels good to just let someone have it every once in a while, or maybe a lot. And you can't overcome this, and, and it's okay because your dad did it. And see, the enemy tries to convince you. Your mom was always gossiping about everyone and trying to find everything bad about someone. And, and that, it's, just, it's just what we see. I mean, we're just kind of doomed. We, we see it. And so you've just learned that really that's what everybody does. And you think that. And so you just start talking about people. Come on, it's fun. And you got to find everyone else's faults. And you can't quit because it's just in you. The enemy loves to keep you bound. That's his goal. Trapped in sin. Not sure how to get out. I want you to know today you're not obligated to your flesh. You're not. You're not trapped in sin. Now, the enemy's trying to tell you that you are and you can't get out. Come on, somebody hear me today. You don't have to be trapped. You're not obligated yeah. to your flesh. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overcome. No temptation has overtaken. None. None of them's overtaken you except what is common to mankind. God's faithful. He won't let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Okay, let me just tell you, you will be tempted more than you can bear if you don't follow him on a way out. Boy, I'm just, I've got more than I can handle. Okay, well, welcome to church. Because you're going to be equipped on how to get out today. That's what the church does. It equips God's people. God's faithful. He gives you a way out. He gives you the power to say no, and, and it's all through the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 12. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. You have no obligation for that. Remember this verse. We need to know it. There's a higher power. There's a power that's way higher than the power of the flesh. The power of the Spirit is way bigger. The Spirit of God will never lead you into sin. Well, God has me here for a purpose. He always leads you out of sin into freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is there's freedom. Now, number two, you have to think about what you're thinking about. <laughs> and you have to think about what I just said, so I'm going to say it one more time. You have to think about what you're thinking about. Now, that's a scary thing to do but have you ever done it? I mean, you just kind of stop and you take inventory of what's running through your mind. It's like there's another part of your mind that goes, okay, I'm going to think about what I've been thinking about. What's running through my mind right now? Romans 8, verse 5, let's keep reading. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Why are people so tormented today? They're not thinking about what they're thinking about. It's really the truth. They're just not even thinking about what they're thinking about. They just let that thinker just go. you got to stop and think about what you're thinking about. (laughs) Sinful desires cannot continually flood your mind, and you live with a mind of goodness, peace, and joy. 
I know what the Bible says in Romans 14, 17. The kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but the living of life, the living of life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. You won't live a life of peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's not going to be there when you're thinking about flesh desires. You just won't. When you find yourself trapped in sin, you need to ask yourself, what am I thinking about? When you find yourself struggling with a walk with God, you need to check your mind. Your life, come on, hear this. Your life is moving in the direction of your thoughts. If you're thinking how miserable things are, guess what? You're headed right where your thoughts are taking you. You cannot have a spiritual life with a carnal mind. You just can't. People want a life led by the Spirit, but they won't change what they're thinking about. You can't be turned, I'm sorry, tuned. You can't be tuned into two radio stations at the same time. For those of you that's never heard tuning into a radio station, there used to be a (laughs) dial on a radio. And you'd run it over, you'd turn it, and if you turned it to the right, it's kind of like righty-tighty, it'd go right, and you'd... Oh, for those that are out there, right? (laughs) You can't go left when you're going right. See, there's there's just a, you cannot have a spiritual life with a carnal mind, and you have to determine what you're thinking. Is that of God? Or is that of flesh? Philippians 4, 8. I love Philippians Four eight says, "Fix your thoughts. Fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, admirable. Think of things that are excellent or praiseworthy. Think of those things. Think of those things. So that needs to be a filter for your thoughts. What a great verse! Yep. A filter for your thoughts. Is this pure? Okay, then I can think about it. When you're rolling through Facebook." And you see something, you go, well, that's not pure. I think I'll look into it. You just had the... Is this pure? Yes, then I can look at it. Then I can look into... You ask, is this right? Then I can think about it. Is this lovely? If it's lovely and it's admirable and it's honoring... come, Come on, are you getting this? Quit thinking on things that aren't. Philippians 4 8, your filter. Really good I can just look at this and tell you I don't need to be looking at this. That just yeah. wow. that was not right. That was not pure. That was not lovely. It's not going to bring praiseworthy wow. stuff into my life. I need to not look. So good. And we got everybody trying to look into everything to find out what's going wrong. And before long, you're looking at it so much you're going wrong. Wow. Sorry, wow. I got a little excited. That was that was the preaching side of me. <laughs> Romans, Romans 12, verse 2. Let's Let's read some more. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you'll learn to know God's will for you, which is good. God's will is good. It's pleasing, and it's perfect. When you think on the thinking patterns of the world, you'll end up being led by and thinking like the world. So I ask you again, think about what you're thinking about. To think like God, you've got to have the power of the Holy Spirit. We talked about this in the first week of me talking about the Holy Spirit. We read this in 1 Corinthians 2.11. We've got to read it again because to think like God would think, here's what you have to know. No one can know a person's thought except that that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. That's why the Holy Spirit is so important. I find the more I set my mind on the Spirit, the more I make spiritual decisions. I make wise decisions. He is my helper. Holy Spirit comes alongside of me. Uh, I I saw a meme, and I I thought this was very, very appropriate today. I'm just amazed that I know what a meme is, you know. But I saw this meme. here's, Here's what it said. Do you need the Holy Spirit to be saved? And the response was, Honey, you need the Holy Spirit just to go to Walmart. 
you need the Holy Spirit for everything going on in your life. And you're just talking about it for being saved. You need him way more than that. When you fix your thoughts on him, you're being led by him, and you'll know what he is wanting. Number three, feed your spirit and kill the flesh. You got to feed your spirit, and you have to kill the flesh. Romans 8, verse 12, Paul continues on. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death, everybody say put to death, death. the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. Now this is strong language. The desires of the flesh will kill you if you don't kill them. You got to put them to death. Paul knows this. Give you a great illustration, and it doesn't have to even be a farmer to know about it. Whatever you feed grows, and whatever you starve dies. This is true in all of life. Feed plants, they grow. Starve a plant, it will die. You feed the flesh, the more it grows. And you starve the spirit. See, you you feed the spirit, the more the spirit grows in your life, and the appetite for the spirit, you'll want more and more and more. And I just, I I don't know it's just that simple, but it is. People feeding themselves filth and expecting faith to rise doesn't happen. People telling me all the time, I just don't have a pure thought life. And they're watching lustful images. They're reading romance novels. They're engaging in things that they're not even telling anyone else about. You're feeding the wrong thing. It's so practical here. If you feed your mind and thoughts things, don't be surprised when that thought comes out into action in your life. It's the way it works. People will watch movies and listen to music with foul language and try to figure out why they can't tame their tongue. You can continually listen to someone put someone else down. You just continually listen to someone else put someone down. You continually listen to someone put someone down. And you fed yourself that. No, I didn't say anything. I just heard. And you just continually listen to someone. And then someone else says something about that someone that that person had been putting down. And guess where your mind goes? And what comes out of your mouth? Huh. And that other person that knows nothing about what you've been feeding yourself goes, what? Well, that's, I just know more about them than you do. You don't know anything. Yeah. You fed yourself all that. That's right. And you just fed yourself and fed yourself and fed yourself. I'm telling you, whatever you feed yourself will grow. Uh-huh. And you better make sure you know what you're feeding yourself. People telling me all the time they don't have a pure thought life. Well, I can tell you why you don't. And I can watch actions of people who don't have a good thought life. It's because that's all they listen to is filth. And sometimes that filth is about other people or about church or about work. Come on. I mean, I've just watch your feed. It's affecting way more than even you know. Watch your feed. Watch that you're not feeding the wrong things and starving the wrong things. You got to guard your eye gate and your ear gate. You know your eye and your ear are gates to your heart. Oh, be careful, little (laughs) eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little eyes. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Oh, I just heard it. It was a gate that entered your heart. Scripture doesn't tell us to suppress the deeds of of your sinful nature, it says to kill it. You put it to death. Scripture doesn't tell it to satisfy. It doesn't say just satisfy that. No, if you satisfy it, you fed it, and it will grow. You have to, hear me today, you have to kill it. The kill will remove it from growth. Now, you kill your flesh, by the word of God, and you feed your spirit by the word of God. See, you, the way you win this thing is the word of God. 
That's the way you win this. The word does both at the same time. It's your weapon and it's your food. I just love this. And when you're not in the word of God and you wonder why you're thinking what you're thinking, you wonder why you just can't kill the, because you're missing the one thing that'll kill it. You're missing the one thing that feeds the right part. The more you're in the word, the more the spirit gets fed. The word is also a weapon. It's powerful and it's sharp. And it will divide what needs divided in your own heart, according to Scripture. Crucify the flesh. Be close to the Spirit. Why? So I don't gratify the desires of the flesh. I don't gratify them. I kill them. When I pray in the Spirit, my spirit man grows. And my desire for flesh ceases. I can't tell you the amount of times I wanted to go punch somebody. Now, I've not done that a lot in my life. I do have brothers. And if you have a brother, it's probably at some point happened, even if you're a female. But I'm just telling you, there were times that I gave in to the flesh. I gave in to the flesh a lot. But even as a grown man, there are times that I have felt a desire to do the wrong thing many times. And I'm telling you, if I did not kill that desire, then it grew because I'd give place to it. You cannot feed something and expect it to die. You just can't. You've got to starve it and you've got to get it dead. Don't give it attention. Number four and the last one, you've got to remember who you are. You've got to remember who you are. Remember who you are. Lion King. Does anybody know the Lion King? Is anybody, anybody, okay, good. Well, let me preach from the Lion King for a second because this is good. <laughs> Simba did something he perceived as wrong, if you've watched the Lion King. The enemy, Scar, convinced him to run away from his destiny. Now, he ran and hid because of something that he had done until he saw his father and his father... When he saw him, helped him remember who he was. And when he remembered who he was, he went back and took his rightful place. Now, I'm not preaching on Akuma and Tata or whatever you call it. That's not what I'm doing. I'm just talking about some things about remembering who you are. It's important. See, Romans 8, verse 14, if we keep reading, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit when He adopted you as His own children. Now we call Him Abba, Father. For His Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we're God's children. Why is this so important? Because if you believe you're a sinner, you're going to act like a sinner. Come on, somebody got that today. When you believe you're a sinner, you're acting like one. But when you believe that you're a child of God, it puts you in a different place. In the physical. Because it makes you die to all the things that wouldn't see yourself as spiritual. I hear people say, well, I'm just a sinner. Quit saying that. Well, I'm just a sinner. You were a sinner. That's not who you are anymore. I'm not a slave anymore. I'm a child. I'm a daughter. I'm a son. I'm not a slave. A role of the Holy Spirit is to remind you of who you are. People struggle with sin Because they struggle with their identity. They just do. So many struggle with who they are. They have no idea, no idea the position they have as a son or a daughter. So what happens is they have a mentality, or they still have a mentality that they've hung on to, of a slave or a sinner. So they think, I'm going to try to do something right. So I work really hard to overcome the flesh And when I realize I can't do it, then I think God is mad at me because I broke his laws. Come on, are you following me? 
that, that's, that's what happens. And so we think, well, dad's mad, father's mad. Father's mad, so I can't go around him because he's mad. And so I got to go make it better. And we keep trying in our own ability. And we're doing things in the flesh, with the flesh, expecting a spiritual result. And when we finally go, well, I, I can't do it, what do we do? We run away from God. We run away from the things of God. We run away from the people of God. And we run away and we're like, I, I can't do this anymore. But see, when you were saved, you got a new identity. And today you need to remember who you are. What's important. You're a son or a daughter of the king. If you're saved and you're not a slave. The Holy Spirit is reminding you that you have a good father. And this good father has a wonderful plan for your life. And he is just as sick about you running away as you're sick of running away. It reminded me of parents who asked their children to go and clean their room. And the child goes and looks at their room and they come back out, mom. Dad, there's just so much stuff. There's so, it's, and really, they're right. I mean, it's overwhelming. And so dad comes in and takes a look and says, yeah, you're right. I tell you what, I'll help you. We're going to get rid of a bunch of this stuff. And starts loading it in the trash can. And child's like, no! But really, that would help some of us if we just get rid of some of this stuff. But that's not even my point. It's overwhelming to the child. And they don't see him being able to get it done. And mom and dad's just thinking the whole time, tough load for them. They got to learn it. No, I can tell you what a dad would do. They'd look and they'd just say, if they just come and ask me for some help, you know what I'd do? I'd go sit down with them. I'd help them pick up some toys and say, how about let's put this over here and let's put this over here. And all of a sudden, you've got this that can go here. And and before long, the child cleaning up the room with dad doesn't become slavery anymore. It becomes a joy. It becomes an excitement. Come on, it becomes something that is worth having. I want you to know God didn't leave you here saying, good luck, try to clean up your life. He didn't say, good luck, I just, I wish you the best. He said, I'm going to help you and I'm going to send Holy Spirit to help you and be your guide. And I'm telling you, life will be different for you. But here's what you have to do. You have to ask. You have to ask. Parents, know this. If your child asks you and you come in there here, what's going to happen? You're going to do most of the work anyway. Really. As God's children, if we just ask us what he'd do, he'd do most of the work anyway. He'd do most of it for you. He's not left you alone. He wants your life cleaned up. He wants it in good shape. He wants it ready for service. He wants you to know that he will win in the end. And well, I keep losing every battle. Well, get on the right team. Think about what you're thinking about. Come on, you can say no. You you can say, you don't have to deal with that anymore. You need to know who you are. Come on, are you getting anything from this word today? You got a spirit man and you got a flesh man. And they are neither one taking you to the same place. You better... Make a decision to kill the flesh and live by the Spirit.